Greg Glassman, CrossFit's founder, has greatly impacted fitness worldwide. His adaptable approach bridges elite athletes and everyday individuals, emphasizing excellence and personal responsibility. He has built a global gym network and a community valuing mental strength and mutual support. Glassman champions the Broken Science Initiative, enhancing scientific reasoning's predictive power. He promotes logical, transparent science, extending beyond fitness to society's problem solving and knowledge acquisition. In Summary, Glassman is a fitness luminary and an advocate for intellectual rigor, leaving a lasting mark on fitness and broader scientific discourse, inspiring self-improvement in health and intellect. So let's dive right in. Let's do it. Greg, I'm, I'm just going to get straight into the question. So, um, yeah. you know, I think you honestly have been the person that has given me and my entire family the most opportunities in life. And for that, I will honestly be forever grateful. You taught me so much about not only like work and business um, and that working as a team can be fun and inspiring and we can change lives while doing it. But, um, you know, you've also you also allowed me to grow as a human being. And I will be you know, you've made the you've made the biggest impact on my life. And I really want you to know that. Well, thank you very much. It it was a two way street. We had a good thing going. Oh, the cross was, effort was uh, unprecedented, and it was, I think, the most important CrossFit work. Let's go back to that with your original vision of CrossFit Health and what you wanted it to be, because I think it's a good starting point for us to get started here. Yeah, the the tagline that we used was "Let's start with the truth," and uh, you know, when when you talk about things like the replication crisis and the problems in research, um, and failings of academic science, it, 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 or even or even the health of the nation, the question comes around, what are you going to do about it? And the thing that they want to fix is not the health, but the system. And I'm of the view that that's not going to happen. And But I, I, I do feel this, that um, regardless of, I don't think there's going to be a solution, but I am perfectly convinced there won't be a solution without recognizing the problem. And so the first thing we do is let's start with the truth. Let's just admit what's wrong here. And and we were, I think, fairly into that phase when it all came to an end. But uh, oh. we're starting again. And I, I have someone that I think you should talk to, and that's Jay Cooey. Um, I know you've met him. He came out to my house, and he's a, he's a, a friend of, uh, of Rodney's, which is hilarious. The people yeah. that meet through Rodney's just amazing. But... Uh, Jay is a uh, science advisor to the Children's Defense Fund. He's working with uh, RFK Jr. And oh, that's a relatively man. new position for him. But he is, he is a brilliant uh, uh, biologist, a geneticist, I believe an evolutionary geneticist. And he was a lecturer at uh, Cornell uh, Medical School and a, a brilliant mind. But that's uh, something I'd love to pass your way. It reminds you of the old school, the people we had around. It's kind of a Malcolm Kendrick in his own right. Wow, that's a good. I mean, those were magical days. They were the NBA ones, getting all the physicians together, the DDCs. Um, I I don't know of one person who doesn't reach out and say like, "Are you guys having that again?" And you are doing it with the Broken Science Initiative. But before we get onto the Broken Science Science Initiative, I really want to take it a whole step back because you've been very vocal about corruption within peer-reviewed scientific journals. And particularly your experiences with the NSCA, I would love for us to dig into that because that just kind of went away. Yeah, the uh, the NSCA published a study that said that uh, CrossFit, that to summarize it, that CrossFit was uh, largely effective, that it had uh, uh, favorable and dramatic improvements in body composition and uh, whatever. The, the, the metabolics were good, but alas for an excessive injury rate and i just took one look at the study and i saw that they had a i forget what the injury rate was but it, it roughly correlated to those number of people that when you introduce them to exercise don't come back and there's nothing you can do about that except sit around and sing kumbaya and hold hands and maybe do some downward dog or something that'll cause me some heat but uh uh there was uh I know, huh? Right off the bat. But, I love uh, you so much. But there was a... Uh, uh, 
the injury egg correlated yeah yeah it's at 16 to 20 percent that like that that sucked i'm not going back and that looked to be like the injured number and they could have gotten away with it if they'd said 16 percent were injured and a 20 percent oh, just didn't come back because they didn't want to work out hard but that that piece was missing and so i sicked the russes on them and sure enough the whole thing was a fraud there were no injuries and so we took them to federal court and I went on tour, uh, the soda tour, and the motivation for going after soda was it, it sure it's, it's, uh, it's got a, a lethal uh, uh, impact on metabolism, uh, but uh, a lot of things aren't good for you. And we weren't going on a fentanyl tour, and we didn't go on a, a methamphetamine tour. We went on the soda tour, and the reason for that is that the organization that take this study, the NSCA and their partners, the ACSM, they seem to have no visible means of support outside of their involvement with the soda companies for whom they were, the soda companies were either a gold or a platinum sponsor of the two big soda giants. So we went on the, on the road and I just pronounced the ACSM and the NSCA as soda whores and I got sued in state court for it. And uh, my attorney said, um, that's not even defined. What does it even mean to be a soda whore? And then I volunteer, well, I'll tell you exactly what it means. I, I know what it is, you know? Um, I think we're whoring when we sacrifice our values. Uh, it, it's, it's less honest than, than real whoring, but you sacrifice all of your values for cash. And yes. that's clearly what was going on with the soda companies. We asked for emails, their correspondence with soda, and they said there was none. We produced some, and that, that irritated the judge. Now they'd already pissed off the judge in the federal case and had their uh, servers uh, examined by uh, ex-FBI in which we found uh, literally millions of documents that were, that were uh, 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 to, you know, emails they didn't have, they had millions of them. And they tried the same thing in the state court and we got the same thing, a forensic, uh, uh, order for evaluation, a, a legal order for a for forensic examination of their servers. And sure enough, they were soda horse for sure. But when the, when the discovery came back from the, uh, when the results came back from the forensic court ordered examination, the suit was dropped suddenly. And, but you know, the corruption was unprecedented. Uh, it seemed to me, and we actually had uh, William Kramer, the head of the NSCA, um, sock puppeting reviewers in the review process. And we had emails where you could actually witness the suborning of uh, fabrication, falsification of data. He tells them, I can't publish this without injuries. They said, there were no injuries. He said, well, we can't publish it. And they came back two weeks later with injuries. And we got our hands on all of those emails. Now, I knew the process to be corrupt, but I don't believe that all science that won't replicate, which is a huge chunk of academic science, it's not all um, um, corruption in that sense. And what I've discovered over the past uh, five years of looking at this before even getting canceled and leaving, um, what I knew is that, that there was an epistemic corruption in the sense of like a corrupted file. And that's something that's altered to the point where it's no longer functional. And what's happened is that there's been an epistemic debasement of, of the science that's practiced in academia. And it's less true of the natural sciences, but it's certainly true of the social sciences. And I don't think anyone would care about psychology and sociology and economics not replicating or having relevance to the real world, sadly. Um, that's not too upsetting, but the problem is that medicine has followed suit. And that the methods that have produced the science that won't replicate in psychology, sociology, economics, gender studies and other other what murray douglas calls uh, rubbish degrees um medicine has fallen in that same in that same position and so what we have is two forms of corruption there's a corruption that's an alteration of a of a structure so that it it no longer functions but what that does is makes ineluctable makes certain the uh, second type of corruption which is just the the thievery and it's kind of like if you if you had a shortcoming, a shortfall at your bank and you decided that you weren't going to have the security guard there on Wednesdays, um, you're going to get robbed on Wednesdays. 
And that's exactly what's happened. And what's happened in academic science is that the critical phase of validation where we have a, 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 a successful prediction of an observable, there's a language of Matt Briggs or the physicist E.T. Jaynes called it a physical prediction. My father referred to it as a forecast of a measurement, but that phase of validation has been replaced in academic science with, uh, with uh, uh, null hypothesis, significance testing, p-values, confidence intervals, and all of that. And those things are at best, at best, and I love this term, mildly inductive, mildly inductive. And uh, wow. science is purely inductive. And that inductive skepticism, and we can we can point to the to the start of the end with uh, Karl Popper's uh, uh, error in the falsification, uh, error of falsification is a demarcation between science and in his in instance he used uh, uh, nonsense. But I would say that the demarcation you want is between science and non-science, and the thing that differentiates astrology from astronomy, and that was in fact the example that that. Uh, that Popper had, had actually introduced at one point, but the true demarcation is the predictive strength of the models in astronomy compared to astrology. And that is the Ooh. demarcation, and that alone, that alone. And, and we've, we've, we've removed that entirely. In fact, the system of, of inference, the statistics that are applied to science throughout the university, that group doesn't even admit to the, to the, probability of a hypothesis have a meaning they're stuck on the probabilities of the data and again the, the, the information you get there is, is mildly inductive and the whole attempt was uh, created by philosophers to make the system of, that we call science and scientific method they wanted it to be deductive because they were looking for certainty and that hobgoblin of small minds the certainty um, in refusing to deal with being incapable of dealing with uncertainty caused academic science to miss out on the most important advances in uh, probability theory that uh, that have ever occurred. Some of the most important mathematics to have ever been uh, developed has been developed in the past, uh, you know, shoot, it's going on right now, but from now to going back maybe 50, 60 years ago, um, some very, very important advances improbability theory have been made and uh, that's been that's been largely missed by the by the academic set okay but okay so going back to the nsea before we move on to more science um why did, so you, the the win really came through the final decision really came through once you'd left crossfit right we had been awarded uh all of the there were uh, inference sanctions that where the court established that the NSCA had faked the study, that the NSCA had lied, that the NSCA was a commercial competitor. Um, and it was, our attorneys, frankly, were stunned. There was nothing left to uh, adjudicate other than the, uh, the extent and the manner of the damages. And uh, I got driven off and that case was settled um, in secrecy. And I, I had they... made it clear, I'd even gotten the judge to acknowledge uh, my position in this. And I'd asked my attorneys repeatedly to make it clear to the judge that in this case, the currency of victory would be light, that only truth could make us whole. And that if I got a $100 million judgment and uh, had to keep quiet, it was a loss. If I got $5 and could run my mouth off, and explain to the world what they ha what happened, that would be a win. So you feel that you <coughs> lost because you me. weren't able to, so do you feel that you lost because you weren't able to explain it further at that point I don't, in time? I don't know if it was a win or a loss, but I, I would take it as a loss. And my assumption is, is that uh, uh, the, the new owners, wh whoever that is, are tied to this issue too close for the truth to come out. And I see it in the direction of the company too. Okay, I want to move on to the direction of the company a little bit later. But right now, yesterday you sent me an article on climate studies, right? 
I'd love to hear your thoughts on the idea that consensus in climate studies is driven more by the societal pressures, sorry, and bullying than any scientific evidence. Because this is a big thing. Of course it is. You know, a study was published that showed there'd been no increase in typhoons, storms, droughts, uh, crop disasters. None of that was going happening. And the line was that the uh, the uh, the climate change that we're worried about has not yet begun to occur. It's not happening. And that thing ended up getting taken down eventually, retracted, and it wasn't retracted for being wrong. It was retracted for coming to a conclusion that wasn't politically viable, wasn't tenable, without shame, without, I mean, just open admission. And I, did I send that to you yesterday? The piece from the yeah. email? Yeah. And it's just amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it's incredible. And just the, I mean, the well, amount I, of I want to lure everyone to something. When things, and I'm sorry to step on you, but I, I just have to get this off my chest. Um, yeah. What gets censored is things that are true. But, yeah. You know, like, there's this these flat earth morons around, you know, no one's censoring them. There's no, there's no worry that's going to take, get, get legs and run. None of the censoring on the COVID issue, on climate change, uh, none of that is to is to stop misinformation. It's to stop a truth. That's how you deal with things that that you won't survive if, if people find out. You got to shut those people up. Yeah, and they shut you up. Well, not, but for a little period of time, right? You're back right now. You're able to speak again. Why? Well, I, I went upstream. I, uh, I, you know, it was interesting to me that when we say at one point, everywhere we looked, there was, we only found corruption in the places we looked and, uh, how pervasive is this problem? And, you know, what, what, how is it that Alzheimer's research, uh, chronic disease research, nutrition research, how can it all be so fatally flawed? What's going on here? And then the COVID thing, I think, was a wonderful example for everyone. And it, you know, I saw a T-shirt the other day that said it wasn't as a pan it wasn't a pandemic; it was an IQ test. And I think that's I think that's becoming abundantly clear. Yeah. Right, but the amount of hatred once again, this bullying that comes out when you mention it. I mean, I was listening to you and Sevon speak the other day, and you mentioned some of the COVID stuff as well, and, and some of the like the hate speech that came out there it was just crazy. Yeah, yeah. I frankly, I'm enjoying the whole thing. Yeah, you always do. Yeah. I feel like you always enjoy creating these conversations that spark so much passion or fear in people, and this is where the real dialogue happens. I told I told him when you got uh, Glenn Begley on the phone. Uh, with me and have you spoken to him in recent times at all i have not but he was so wonderful and he was great and it, and it turned out we had a mutual friend in uh in uh, michael shank through jim jordan yes. which was the most yes. unlikely the just an amazing coincidence that as brilliant research in australia is close to a to a kid that grew up next door to me but uh and they couldn't be more different too, right, Jim and, and Glenn? So I told Glenn that I was fascinated, really enthralled with this shitty science. And it was like science porn. And I, he laughed and I said, is something wrong with me? He says, I don't know, but if, if there is, I have it too. And he said he was going to use that line, that science porn. But uh, perverted mm -hmm. science is a fascinating thing. Let's dig into that because I would love you to expand on that and also like where this concept came from because I had the privilege of knowing your dad, right? And he had some very dense ideas that definitely forms the groundwork of what you're doing. Um, can we talk about him? Yeah, I mean, I remember him up at the health conference running on about p-values and we were all rolling our eyes like, how long is this gonna, gonna, gonna go on, you know? And, and now I've got that. Now I now I've inherited that mantle, and I'm the guy. You have, yep. I'm trying to talk to people about p values. And by the way, if anyone wants a, a great education on them, uh, Gerd Gigerenzer at the Max Planck Institute. It's quite a name, but he's a 
absolutely delightful man. And we've, we've had interaction with him. G-E-R-D and then Gigerenzer is just spelled phonetically G-I-G-E-R-E-N-Z-E-R. But uh, Gerd has published, <coughs> excuse me, extensively on, uh, on p-values and their failings on null hypothesis significant testing. And it's extremely accessible material. But if you ask scientists why we do these p-values and you take a list of the, uh, of the answers that are extremely common, in fact, it, the, there's been measurement done. Uh, uh, people have actually done this experiment and asked researchers um, what's in the p-value. And there's a list of common responses or beliefs, and they're all false. They're all patently false. The, the misunderstanding, and I think it's, I think it's, I think it's deliberate. I think that the p value is used to give the imprimatur of validation. Of course it is. And in fact, all of the uh, misconceptions around the p value, that it speaks to the probability of the null hypothesis, that it speaks to the probability of the alternative hypothesis, that it suggests with a 0.05 that there's a 95% chance of of the study replicating. All of these things are false. And they all work in the same direction to, 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 uh, to uh, give confidence to the, to the findings. And it's been, it's been one of the greatest intellectual failings of, 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 of all history. Most research findings are false. That's John Iannotti's and, uh, and, you know, I think we all know what most means, more than half, right? Mm -hmm. And that, and we don't even know how to tell which ones are, are good or bad anymore. And so what a clinician has to do um, is we, we favor those studies that are consistent with our clinical experience. And boy, that's not the same thing as digging in and, and looking and doing a deep dive on the methodology. But that's really not possible to do in this climate. And you do have an obligation if you're going to call yourself scientific or a scientist, your first obligation has to be to empiricism. And so any theory that doesn't jive with what you're seeing and clinically, you need to dismiss it. Don't, uh, don't, don't change what you see or hear based on a theory. What you see, what you hear, our observations have to turn into measurements that are then that, that become facts that are supported that support the theory. See, the process of science is this: we start with an observation, which is a registration of the real world on our senses or sensing equipment, and then those observations, if they can be tied to a standard scale with a well characterized error, become a measurement. And for the purposes of science, we can call that a fact, and then we map a fact that is a measurement that's got a well-characterized air of an observation. Um, we tie that fact to a future unrealized fact as a prediction. And the probability of that, the return on that, is the, is the sole source of validation. In fact, it's the, it's the only rational basis for trust in science. And that is the predictive strength of its models, nothing else. And we can take it a step further that predictability is the cornerstone of trust in everything. You trust your wife, you trust your kids or not. You trust your doctor, you trust your bank, your insurance company trusts you, right? All trust is, is the cornerstone of his predictability. And that has been flensed from, from academic science. It's so very, it's, it's very well understood in the space of like physics, hard chemistry. Yeah. Yeah, the, the number of academics that can tell you exactly what's wrong in academic science is, is really interesting. And that's my new mess spurts. Those are the people I've been hanging around. Okay, let's talk about the Broken Science Initiative that you and Emily are, um, you know, have, have started together. Well, I understand what, what led you to, to, you know, to create this incredible initiative, but can you tell us more about that for people who have never heard of it? Yeah. You know, I don't really, really know what's going on with it. Um, you know, I don't like, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I can't, I won't stop. 
And uh, I, I've introduced myself to, I think, the world's best minds on, on science and the scientific method. And I hit them up with, uh, I introduced myself by saying that it seemed to me that when science replaced uh, predictive strength with consensus as a determinant of a model's validity, at that moment, science becomes nonsense. And I shot yeah. that out to Briggs and, and uh, uh, our friend Anton and Jim Franklin in, in Australia. And I got, I got great responses, made some super friends almost immediately. And I realized that just much like in the health space, there were people that knew of each other's work, may have met at conferences like Max Entropy Conference or something like that. They knew of each other and were admiring each other's work, but had never, never met, had not actually spoken. You know, and so we were able to bring those people together uh, in Zoom calls, in person, and created something. It's pretty cool. And so <coughs> I remember. Excuse me. That, no, um, that you wanted to create a curriculum for schools. Is that still something that's on your radar? That's that's part of it. I mean, we've got we've got an essay that could expand into a book that could turn into a curriculum that, frankly, could even be a degree offering. There's a there's, there are things there are things within our broken science effort discoveries we've made like on plausible reasoning. I think that's the most important thing not taught in school. That would be a great thing to do to share with people this notion of plausibility. It's closely tied to the way the brain works, to the way we function and think naturally. And uh, and uh, George Paglia, the uh, mathematician, did some of the best work on mathematics and uh, and uh, uh, plausible reasoning. But uh, there's so much uh, uh, interpretations of probability, uh, foundations of statistics, demarcation issue. Uh, there's so many hot topics that are uh, fun to play with and, and uh, developments in inference, uh, just discussing predictability, certainty and uncertainty. These are, these are essential vocabulary that's kind of been left out of our, left out of our schooling. I don't know of a, I don't know of a, uh, I, I don't think the job of the philosophy of science uh, is complete. And I don't think that there's an academic philosophy of science that reflects uh, industrial science or science that replicates. So what can we do to support this? Your initiative, what needs to happen, these misfits, yeah, I think the material that we're putting on the uh, brokenscience.org uh, website, I think it's I think it's pretty good. Some of it's very good, and uh, just introducing these topics to people, I think, is important. You know, I, I send people to Wikipedia, and I hate that damn thing. Um, it's uh, <laughs> I remember, but you know, you can you can get a sense that there's a that there's something going on, and when I tell you to go to uh, uh, Wikipedia and look at the article on hyperglycemia. I send people there because they got it exactly fucking wrong, and you can see the corruption and, and where that played out. But some of the some of the Wikipedia stuff is adequate to the task of introducing people to these concepts, where you can actually see there's a there's a dispute. Or I mean, the language on replication. The article they call it the replication crisis, right? And, and on demarcation, they refer to it as the demarcation problem. On a foundation of statistics, they said that it's a 200 year old debate, but the one thing everyone can agree on is that statistics has its foundations in probability theory, but you go to probability theory and you see there's a holy war underway, that there's huge, huge debate. And introducing people to, to these ideas, interpretations of probability, foundations of statistics, uh, uh, advances in uh, uh, developments in, in inference. Um, in introducing people to these things, we can start to paint a picture of, of a science that replicates. And I do believe it's something that could be taught to elementary school kids. So the goal with, with the Broken Science Initiative is not to unfuck science because that ain't going to happen. But what we can do is educate someone to the point where they know to laugh when someone like Fauci says, if you don't, if you don't follow me, you don't believe in science or whatever his, whatever his language was. 
because it is laughable and it should have been laughed at. Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. So, um, like when when you talk about the science, you know, yeah, the science, I get settled right? right then. You know, you're on in a bad space. The science, yes. absolutely, because science is never settled. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm hearing a ton of like, and I'm not at CrossFit corporate, should I call it anymore? Um, but I hear that, you know, from what I saw as well, like affiliates are scared. CrossFit affiliates don't know where to go because they don't have this parent figure, which you were, to ground them and guide them with a simplicity and talking about virtuosity and the methodology and just keeping it so real. What advice do you have for these affiliates, especially the newer ones and the newer coaches, the ones who weren't under you and, you know, Dave and Nicole and the seminar team, what advice do you have for them to thrive in the current landscape? You know, when I speak with affiliates, the Josh Honeycutts and, and, uh, and Craig Howard and, and, uh, Howard. Yes. And, uh, uh, Dale King. Dale King. Yeah. Yep. Um, these guys, I got nothing to give them except attaboys <laughs> and cats on the backs. You know, the, the CrossFit is, is, is perfectly strong that all of the strength sits in the relationship with the gal that unlocks the door at 430 in the morning and the people that, that come through. And everything else yeah. is irrelevant, especially what's done at HQ. And so at Whistler, my goal there was to give a view of the 10-year affiliates that they would recognize themselves in my view. And they would also recognize that I saw what it is that they did. And so I came up with a list of things that would have meaning to me. You know, I... I, I uh, I offered a seminar that I would have borrowed a thousand dollars to gone to, right? I set an affiliate program up that I would have participated in. And I wrote journal articles that if someone had put those in my hands 20 years earlier, I would have been 20 years further down the road. These are the, these yeah. are the secrets I had to learn the hard way. And, uh, and so, uh, a lot of what I'm hearing now are, are things that I would opt out on that I wouldn't, that I wouldn't participate in. And okay. what I found is that those things, there were things that we could do at the mothership that the gym couldn't do. And I can't train yeah. your people. I can't clean your bathroom. You know, I can't, I can't do any of that kind of stuff, but we can uh, validate your methodology. We can provide additional education. We can uh, fight, fight. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, rapacious legislation and, and litigation. And we did all of those things effectively very effectively. And so that's why I would have stayed affiliated. <sighs> it's all good. The, you know, everything is just as it was before at Dell King's gym, even better. Josh Honeycutt isn't, isn't, uh, you know, he may miss me, but there's, there's nothing that the, that the mothership has currently, uh, conceived has to offer him. But they maintain their, they are maintaining the integrity of CrossFit at its core. They are, yes. Yeah. See the That's what I'm saying. The, they are. Don, poor Don, he has a he has a fiduciary obligation to his shareholders, to the owners. And that is considered both in business it's an ethical and a legal obligation. Um the courts would take a dim view of you not uh, staying true to that fiduciary obligation. <coughs> and what that does is that makes each of the affiliates, uh, you know, there, it's kind of like, it's kind of like at Facebook, you're the product, you know, and it would be something would be wrong with Don if he didn't look to the masses and see them as, as, uh, selling jump ropes and, I mean, the things I resisted, we call them bright and shiny objects. They became, uh, it became the yes. and I got a list of them. It was, there wasn't going to be a CrossFit jump rope. There wasn't going to be a CrossFit, uh, uh, energy drink, right? Well, yeah. We, we, 
we had, you know, is it, it was fascinating when Amazon came around, uh, they were having to actually able to tell me that I could be a, I could be a fish oil billionaire. And they knew how many CrossFitters there were on Amazon. Um, they could, they can, they could determine crazy things on your purchases. And I probably shouldn't share a lot of it, but it was, it was fascinating and even funny how few purchases it took for them to figure out whether you were straight or gay, Democrat or Republican, a CrossFitter or not. And they knew how much fish oil CrossFitters were eating. And we got hooked up with the Nordic Naturals and there was going to be a CrossFit fish oil pill. And I go, how's it different than yours? It'll be the same thing. It'll just say CrossFit. And uh, I realized with each pill you swallow that you purchase, it's really no different than Nordic Naturals one. The brand is being devalued by that exact by that exact amount. For sure. So we didn't do it. Now, what thank you, goodness we built a bike with seven. We built some luggage with uh, with uh, saddleback leather. But I felt that that bike and those bags were like the training methodology, best in class. And we never made any money class. off the 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 drummer from Fallout Boy bought one of the bicycles. I think that was the only bike we sold. I remember that. And I didn't care. I like he he can afford anything. And he's a bike freak, and he knows we made one of the best bicycles that ever been made. And so I remember that. Name. You know, everything that you did and talking about Saddleback and the bicycle, like that stuff was beautiful, beautiful, unique, minimalist, just absolutely gorgeous. Anything that you were willing to put your energy into was always of the very, very best quality in every way. Yeah, you're very you know? good. No, thank you. 